guess it's been about uh, 10 years ago. My wife and I were doing our best to buy a house up in uh, or somewhere in the area of the center. And uh, my lovely wife is here tonight. How about that? You know what? I loved you the moment I saw you, and uh, this August it'll be 43 years. And I know what you're thinking, trophy wife. Uh, anyway, we were trying to buy a house in La Center. Not we were looking for a house to buy up in La Center, and and so uh, one day my friend Dave and I we decided to go up there and just, you know, drive around. We'd been to real estate agents and looked through catalogs, but you never know, you know, for sale by owner and stuff like that. So we were just driving around the back roads around La Center, and we came by this one really neat kind of, you know, tiny little farmhouse. There was the house, and it had a, a cute little miniature barn and a cute little miniature pasture. Probably the whole thing was only maybe two acres but there was enough room, you know, to have a horse or something out there if you're into that kind of thing. And uh, there was a sign that said, moving sale. So, you know, we got nothing better to do. Let's, let's go into the moving sale, see if we can find some kind of, you know, precious item for next to nothing. And uh, so we went in and looked around, and there was a guy in there, the guy that owned the house, <laughs> the guy that was moving, he was in there, and uh, we're looking around, and I think my friend Dave asked him, because uh, I'm not the world's greatest conversationalist, and so Dave said, well, why are you moving? And the guy kind of went into this tirade where he said, uh, you know, we came up here a year ago, it was, you know, a year ago back then, and it was a day, it was, you know, it was like about this time of year, you know, late spring, just almost or early summer, and he said, we came up here from California, and it was uh, in the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. The sky was blue, and the birds were singing, and it was just beautiful, and we found this house, and we just said, that's it. We're going to sell the stuff in California, and we're going to move up here, and we're going to live here. I said, okay, you know, that kind of makes sense. And then we, you know, kept talking to the guy, and uh, finally Dave said, well, why are you... Why are you moving? You know, why are you leaving? He said, because the very next day it started to rain and it hasn't stopped yet. <laughs> True story. So Dave and I are getting the car. He had this little Volkswagen bug, as I remember. And uh, we're kind of talking. Oh, the guy was funny, you know. He came up on a nice day and it's raining, har, har, har. And then Dave, my friend Dave, he said the funniest thing. He said, oh, it's just the first flush. What are you talking about? He says, it's just the first flush. You know, that first rain, it flushes all the Californians back out. <laughs> and it was true. It worked. You know, and I couldn't help but think this morning, thinking through this passage we're going to look at in, uh, it's John chapter 6. Uh, how many of you have, were, have been around long enough to remember when out at the Clark County Fairgrounds we used to have Jesus Northwest? A few of you? Yeah. Used to go out there and see bands like Petra and White Heart and Mylan and Broken Heart. Lots of heart. Dark Heart, White Heart, Blue Heart, Red Heart. And, uh, you know, along with the music, they'd have these guest speakers, you know, sort of big name guys, I guess, back then. And uh, the night I was there, this, the guy uh, speaking was uh, Tony Campolo. You don't hear about him much anymore. All right but you did for a while. And uh, so Tony got up, you know, and he's kind of an evangelist type, and gosh, there's, I don't know, five, six, eight thousand 8,000 people, you know, around the grandstand there. And uh, he kind of teaches a Bible study, tells some funny stories. He's a really funny guy. And then after about 45 minutes, he got to the end of his time, and he did kind of a traditional altar call. And he was, you know, and he came to this powerful conclusion. And so, if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life tonight, right here, right now, raise your hand. And, I, and I'm, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Just about everybody there raised their hand. And Campolo did the coolest thing I've ever seen. He said, put those hands back down. You obviously don't know what I'm talking about. 
And I remember thinking, it's the first flush. And then he ex- went on to explain, you know, the act of the commitment he was talking about. And uh, the next time he asked for more hands, there weren't nearly as many. The first flush, this passage in John chapter 6, if you haven't turned there yet, uh, find it. Well, I guess I should say that uh, last time uh, Daniel asked me to, to teach, we uh, looked at John 5, the man at the well. He'd been at the well wanting to, um, at the well to be made well, I guess, at the water. And, uh, you know, Jesus asked him, do you, do you want to be made well? And instead of answer yes, the guy started making excuses about why it wouldn't work for him. And so the, the, you know, the theme of that passage is, do you really want to be made well? Or are you so caught up and hung up in being identified by your infirmity, by your struggle, by your issues, that you really, even though you say you want to be made well, you, you really cling to those things and don't want to let go? And uh, I don't know how many of you were here, but man, I've, I've done that. I've been through that. I have hung on to grief and, and bitterness and uh, all kinds of ugly stuff and, and, you know, and beg God to please, you know, heal me or deliver me or kill them or, you know, <laughs> vengeance is mine, says the Lord, so how about now, you know, would be my attitude, but Fortunately, I do want to be made well, and God's done an incredible, truly miraculous thing in my life and, and set me free from all that baggage. And right here in chapter 6 now, we're at the, the very next chapter in, uh, in the Gospel of John, and I, we're going to start up at verse 41, but I want to read a couple of verses to get it in context. Now, you need to buckle your seatbelt here. We are going to work through this almost one verse at a time and, uh, and really, you know, dig deep and get uh, some really good stuff out of this. So, in uh, the first part of John 6 uh, is one of those occasions where Jesus fed thousands and thousands. This one is known as the feeding of the 5,000. But if you notice the text, uh, what is it, uh, verse 2, then a great multitude follow him because, because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased, on those who were sick. And it goes on to say there were 5,000 men there. But be sure you understand that, you know, in that culture, they only counted the adult males. So when they say 5,000 men, they mean 5,000 men. And if you are conservative and guess that maybe only half the men were married and their wives were there, and then if you're still conservative and say that only half of those couples had one child, which in that culture, you know, you were bound to have four, five, six or more kids, conservatively, you're looking at at least 10,000. Some people will estimate as many as 20,000 people. This is a big deal, right? Lord... They don't have anything to eat. Well, Philip, you give them something to eat. How are we going to do that? You know, all the money in our pockets and, and then some isn't going to buy enough food for these people. Besides, we're out in the middle of nowhere. This, you know, the, this, this isn't going to work. Yeah, well, here's this kid with some, you know, some uh, fish and some bread, and Jesus prayed, multiplied it, fed the fed the 10, 20, however many thousand. And so that's this great multitude that verse 2 talks about. Uh, Down in verse 15, you know, he was a popular guy, as you might imagine at this point. Everybody was was glutted, was full. It says, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself himself. Alone, So these people were so impressed with this miracle that they were actually going to grab him. I don't know, were they going to drag him back to Jerusalem? And, you know, make, but they were going to make him king, and he recognized that and knew the time wasn't right for that. And besides, he wasn't the kind of king that they had in mind. So he goes back up on a mountain. And I don't know, those of you that have been to Israel, and if you haven't, man, you got to go. you got to save up you know, sell your snowmobile or whatever it is, you know, and, and uh, you got to go to Israel. It's just, it's just awesome. So he doesn't want to be king. There, there's, there, there, 
what I started to say was it says they went up on a mountain. There are no mountains in Israel. We look around and we see, you know, what's left of Mount St. Helens. You can see Mount Hood. If you're in the right place, you can see Mount Rainier or one of the other mountains. A mountain uh, in Israel is, you know, the, the, the little hill I go over on the way home. So we went up probably what we think of as the Golan, Golan Heights, right around the Sea of Galilee there on the east side. And we jump up to verse 22. On the next day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea, oh, I, I, should, I should back up a little bit. They saw there was no boat there. When it started to get dark, the disciples took off in, the, in a boat. This is a big chapter, chapter 6. Lots of exciting stuff. They took off to go up to Capernaum on the, up around the corner of the uh, sea of Galilee. Jesus stayed on land, and you've, you've heard, you know this story. In the middle of the night, a big storm whipped up, and the, uh, the apostles in the boat thought they were going to be capsized and drown and die, and then they see this apparition walking towards them, and Jesus says, hey, don't freak out. It's me. It's really me. And then not only is that incredible, but he gets in the boat, and the text says that Instantly, they were at, at their destination. So now you've got this multitude, who knows how many, 10, 20,000 that had been fed this incredible, you know, miracle meal. And now the, even his closest guys have gone, whoa, this is over the top. Walking on water, sort of transported or translated from out in the middle of the lake over to the, the shore of Capernaum. And, uh, on, and so the very next day now, see that was in the middle of the night, the next day, the people who were on the other side of the sea, the people that were there that got fed, they saw that there was no other boat there except the one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat and his dis- but, uh, with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. Okay, that's they're out there. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. Uh, Let's keep going. When the people therefore saw that Jesus wasn't there, you know, he's up in Capernaum now, and they see that uh, he's not around, they got into their boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him, On the other side of the sea, they said to him, "Uh, Rabbi, when did you come here? And now begins this, you know, if you've got one of those words in red Bibles, you'll notice that Jesus does a lot of talking for the rest of the chapter, and that's where I want to spend the bulk of our time or the rest of our time. What happens here is he answers this question. He speaks to three different groups of people, three different types of people. Now remember, this multitude, who knows how many of the ten to 20,000 actually made the trip to where he is now, but it's still a whole lot of folks. And they're there, he realizes they're there because they, they saw a really cool trick. You know, he was the David Copperfield of his time. But wait a minute, he was up there and then he was back here. He must have a twin. No, there's no twin. There must be a trap door, that's it. In fact, you go to Israel now and they'll say, there's the cave. And I'm telling you, this cave is about, you know, six feet deep by six feet wide. And they say, that's where they say he hid the food that he pulled out to feed the 20,000 people. And you're going, I don't think so, right? So he speaks to three groups of people. And the first group of people he talks to here, starting in verse 41, are the people that mock him, the people that kind of make, make fun of him. You know anybody like that? You know, don't raise your hands. It's a rhetorical question. I know lots of people who just make fun of Jesus, make fun of me, make fun of my faith. Some of it's in, you know, good nature. Some of it's got a little bite to it. The thing is, these, these mocker types, they're, they're just way too smart to believe in Jesus. That's what's going on here. They just think they're too smart. Now, we read in verses 41 and 42. Uh, the Jews complained about him because he said... I am the bread which came down from heaven. You know, he had just that, those seven great I am statements in, in John's gospel. I am the bread of life. I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, well, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I've come down from heaven? Now, one quick note. Whenever you're reading John's gospel, 
and he he refers to the Jews. He's not just talking about all the Hebrews, all the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When he says Jews, he's talking about the religious leaders headquartered in Jerusalem and then spread, you know, in various synagogues and things around Israel. So keep that in mind. And they're thinking, well, we know this guy. We know his dad, we know his mom, how, what's he, you know, I'm the bread for, that came down from heaven. You know, that, that can't be true. That's just silly, right? See, they knew. They knew that Joseph wasn't his birth father. In fact, there's another, a little later in time, as we get closer to the crucifixion, Jesus is in the temple courts, and the, the Jews could be some of these same men, you know, kind of indignantly say, well, we know who our father is, implying that we know who your father's not. It's not Joseph, you know, trying to bring the, the shame on him like that. So they knew that Joseph wasn't his birth father, and, and what they're doing, if you kind of look, think, you know, read between the lines or think this through, they're challenging that, that story, that popular story of the virgin birth. Now, even though it was prophesied in the scripture that they would claim to, to cling to and obey and love and devote their lives to studying, here, here it's come to pass right before them, and they're too smart to believe it. I, I wonder how many of us, like this just occurred to me, you know, we're, we're waiting, the next thing that's, that is scheduled to happen as God's timeline unfolds is when the Lord uh, comes into the sky and calls his people up. And I just wonder how many of us, you know, on the way up are going to go, jeez, I never really believed this would happen. <laughs> You know, you're shot, you're in it, and you're doubting. These guys are watching from a distance, and they're just, you know, no way. Uh, we know you. You're not that guy. You know, I can explain the virgin birth really easy. It's a miracle. God just did it. You know, you don't need a scientific or, you know, uh, my friend Chuck Missler has a theory for everything, but you don't need a theory for the virgin birth. You just know that God did it. And he says there, you know, it, it, it's, it's a sign. You know, Jesus did lots of signs. You know, the resurrection, fulfilled prophecy, all that kind of stuff. And here they're, they're stumbling, they're, they're stuck right there at the, at the get-go of the thing. You ever heard of a thing called the, uh, uh, what's it called? The law of compound probabilities? It's a mathematical formula for calculating the, the odds or the likelihood of something coming to pass. Easy example is this. You know, they, they, they've measured for years now, and they can confidently say that in California, there's an earthquake on an average of once every two years. So somewhere in the, sometime in the next two years, based on all of recorded history, you can pretty much bet, pretty much count on the fact there's going to be an earthquake in California. Now, if you take those two years and divide them into days, that's one day out of 730. So the odds get a little higher because you break it down a little bit. That's, what, what is it? 1,000, 117,520 minutes, or 111,051,200 seconds, something like that. The odds get real high, real fast, as you compound the thing, right? Well, that's just with one, you know, one thing, one, one prophecy. The virgin birth is a single prophecy. Jesus fulfilled over 300 specific, distinct prophecies that these Jews not only should have been familiar with, I'm sure they were, but they're just too smart, too intellectual to believe that it could really come to pass with this this Galilean, you know, this guy talks with a funny accent because he's from Galilee and he didn't go to, to a rabbi school, you know, and, and he's just a guy from wandering around and related to John the Baptist and they, they just won't believe it. Even when, even when that miracle's right in front of them, they just won't believe it. You know, mockers are just too stubborn to hear God's voice. 
You know, they, they just won't do it. They, they murmur. That's what it says in verse 43. Jesus uh, answered and said to them, don't murmur among yourselves. You know, they're over there having a huddle murmuring. And he goes, hey, you don't, you know, you don't have to do that. See, the difference between a mocker and a true seeker is a true seeker has an open heart. Just an open heart. You haven't predetermined that it can't be true. You, you know, you're, you, you, you want to hear. These guys, they just refuse Jesus. And Jesus says in verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll right, raise him up that last day. Now, here's what you need to see. These Jews, if you'd ask them, Has the Father drawn you? Well, of course he has. I'm a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Levi, and uh, I'm a priest of the Most High God that works in the temple, in, you know, wherever, and I perform the rites and slaughter the animals and burn the incense and pray the prayers. How can you even ask, am I called by God, right? Has God drawn me? But see, a, a true seeker with an open heart would have been drawn to Jesus. That's what he's trying to make. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. See, if you're really hearing from the Father, you're going to be drawn to me, says Jesus. Now, now, all these guys, these experts, they were being taught by God, but they were just too stubborn to really hear what he was saying. Look at verse 45. Jesus here quotes the Old Testament. It's written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Taught by God, but too stubborn. These, they're too smart to believe. They're too stubborn to hear God's voice. You know who, where, where a mocker's faith really is in themselves you know I believe in me what's that song it had to be me it had to be me I looked around finally found someone like me right verse 47 most assuredly I say to you he who believes in me, says Jesus, has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they're dead. He says, he who believes in me has life. I'm, I'm the bread. Now, your fathers ate the miracle bread in the desert, but they died. But he who believes in me, the real bread of life, the one that the manna prefigured, receives eternal life. You know, mockers base their faith on experience. That's, that's the problem, and that's what verse 49 kind of addresses. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. That would be their claim. How can you call yourself the bread of life? You know, our fathers ate the bread that came down from heaven, the bread from God, and, you know, you weren't a part of that, and we're just, you know, we're, we're too stubborn, and we're too smart, and we're not going to believe in you. We believe in us because, you know what? Mockers refuse to believe anything they can't explain or understand. Now, it's, a, it's fair for someone to come investigating the claims of Jesus and want some explanations for, you know, for some of this miraculous stuff. It's only fair, but I always come to this conclusion. If God was small enough for me to understand everything there is to, to understand about him, it really wouldn't be much of a God. He's, he's bigger than that. But these mockers, they, they won't believe. They, they believe in themselves. And so to those mockers, Jesus says in verse 48, again, I am the bread of life. Jump down to verse 50. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Now, you think they're, they're catching on or at least understanding what he's saying? I am the living bread which came down from heaven. That's pretty clear. If anyone eats of this bread... He will live forever. 
and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the world. See, he's talking about giving them eternal life, and they would rather have a debate about who his father is or who the, where the real bread of heaven comes from than just receive the gift of God's grace. I don't, I don't get it. I know it's true, but I don't get it. And, and so often I, I find myself, I don't know, refusing, failing, to, to really walk in or understand or receive God's grace for what it really is. And these folks just aren't going to go there. Who is it? Uh, John Piper wrote in one of his books, Preach the Gospel to Yourself Every Day. I'm a sinner. I was a sinner. Now I'm a saint, saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and who he is and what he did on the cross and that he was resurrected three days later, all, all because of God's grace. So Jesus uses their own words against him. You know, he does that a lot. I think there are several times in the New Testament and near, again, closer to the end of John where, you know, these Jewish religious leaders, they come at him and they think they've, we've got him now. You know, who are going to ask him something like, well, how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? And, you know, and then, you know, act, <laughs> and instead of being stumped, he always outsmarts them and says something where they go away scratching their heads, kind of going, how did he do that? You know, Moses says that a woman caught in adultery should be stoned to death. What do you say? Because if, you know, if, if, if he says, well, no, don't stone her, you're violating, you're abandoning the law of Moses, you're a blasphemer. Yet if he stones the woman, he's, that's not a real good example uh, of grace. Right? So that's in John 8. And he, and he dealt with it just beautifully until all those guys dropped their rocks and walked away. And, the, you know, the guys in the temple are asking him questions and they just think they've got him stumped. And he always says something. And they, I, I get the feeling that they kind of go, mm, he got us again. How did he do that? Well, he did it every time. And he did it because he's Jesus. He's talking about giving them life and they want to debate. You know, mockers in general, real, they aren't wrestling with the issues of life and death and eternity. What they're doing is they're trifling, you know, playing games with words and ideas and concepts and philosophies. Remember that, uh, gosh, I don't know when, this is a long time ago. Cat Stevens had a song, uh, I'm on the road to find out. Anybody remember that? And it was an interesting song because it was all about a person on a spiritual quest that just went from, you know, belief system to belief system to belief system because they actually liked the search more than they really wanted to find that answer they were looking for. And that's not, that's, you know, these mockers would really just, would rather just talk about things, kind of like the guys on Mars Hill we read about in, in Acts. They enjoy that intellectual tug of war, you know. I, I got you. Oh, no, you got me. Well, I got you back. And they don't really want to know the truth because that would end the game. So they just keep tug, tugging, you know. So Jesus uses their own words again against them, verse 53, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. You know, what does he really mean? Now, you can't help but you know, what comes to mind is communion, which we're about to enjoy here in a little bit. Um, you know, his, his, uh, to eat his flesh and to drink his blood. You know, there were those in the first century that accused the Christian church of being cannibals because of this, you know. They, they eat each other and they, they drink their, each other's blood and all that. But what he really means here is that to eat his flesh and drink his blood is to be uh, 
part of and to be sustained by the crucifixion. Let me unpack that a little bit. Keep your fingers in John and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. This is another one of God's greatest hits. You may recognize this. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. See, when Jesus was crucified, well, at least these two things happened. First of all, he took sin. You know, every thought, every word, every action, every every inclination of the human heart Those, those, our propensity, I think, is the right word, to, to ignore God, really, and just perpetuate our self-interest. It says he took that sin, that part of our nature that does that, and he became sin for us. He became that in our place. A lot of people will use the criminal analogy. You know, he, he was innocent, we were guilty, but he became a criminal for us is what they're talking about there. And so what this this passage says is when he died, sin died. Our sin died. When he died, everyone who believes in him has their sin put to death, their sin nature. Now, that doesn't mean you don't sin anymore. Can Can I get a witness? But that nature no longer has to control you. Second, we can now, by faith, we have the, the privilege to be, to be made right with God in his perfect righteousness. I mean, that's the essence of the gospel. Look again at verse 57. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. It's one of those things where if you think if you say it enough times, maybe they'll get it. You know, Paul echoed the same thing in 2 Corinthians when he wrote, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. What he means is this. It's it's the idea, you know, a book uh, doesn't do any good on the shelf. Maybe it's the Bible, maybe it's the book with the key to the, you know, the answer to your quest for business success or relationship success or how to succeed in the neighborhood or whatever. But if you leave the book on the shelf, obviously it can't help you. You got to take it down, you got to read it, you got to have it to gain anything by it. And so by the same token, what Jesus means here when he says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me, what he's getting down to is that you can't leave him on the shelf. You, you got to have this active, uh, dependent, living relationship with him. You got to be sustained by what he did for us on the cross to be sustained by his flesh and blood. That means to remain in him, to abide continuously and permanently in the relationship made possible by his broken body and shed blood. Now, let me think here. I, I grew up in a Christian home, but we didn't go to church or read our Bibles or pray or anything like that. I got shipped off to VBS every summer just so mom wouldn't have to you know, deal with me for a couple hours in the morning. But we, we were Christians. Right? You know, the folks would have argued that Jesus is the Son of God and that's how your sin gets forgiven and you get to go to heaven when you die, whatever that means. They believed it. But I didn't grow up really in a, you know, a church home. And so it wasn't until I was, I think I was 27 or 28 years old, God finally got my attention, which wasn't easy. And I, you know, I still have some, what do they call those, raspberries from bouncing off the concrete or the bottom of the, the hole of the pit of despair. You know, but he, but he got my attention, and one thing leads to another, and next, I'm a believer, I'm a churchgoer, I'm a home Bible study teacher, 
I'm, you know, new believers class leader, and then all of a sudden I've, there's a little Bible study in the center, and after a few months that moves down to the Grange Hall, and we put the shingle out, and it was actually called Crossroads the Center for a while, and they, people started calling me Pastor Ron, and I'm, I was going, who, what, you, me? And so I'm, you know, I'm in the Word, I mean, I'm I'm investing myself. I don't, you know, I haven't even read the whole Bible yet, and I was supposed to teach it. But I was learning, and I was growing, and one of the things I, I, I didn't figure out the answer. I figured out the question. I figured out the problem. And it's one of the things that we built, have built into our uh, prayer room process when people come forward on Sunday mornings to receive the Lord. And, and it has to do with this idea of abiding because you know you, you, we, you know there's a, we just had a talk the other day here at, here in the office about the transaction where you confess your sin and your faith in Christ and then you receive forgiveness and grace and all the rest and in too many American churches that's kind of it. Then you're on your own and you can come and sing the songs and be part of the family, but really that's it. But I was just desperate. to to know more about God, and actually what I really wanted was to know God. I wanted God to be in my life, not just Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights, or not just for a couple of minutes in the morning before I went to work when I said a quick prayer or read a chapter or a couple of verses, whatever, in the Bible. I wanted this 24-7, all day, every day, you know, even in my sleep, constant connection with God and, and, and what we teach the new believers is that there's a couple of things that, that you can begin to do the, the, you know, moments after you put your faith in Jesus and maybe for some of us that's been you know, years and years and years ago but it's not too late the first one is this you, you can begin to live, the Bible uses the word walk, but really what that means is step by step by step, which means as you go through life, in the, in the, uh, uh, the awareness of the influence of God's Spirit. We can do that. It doesn't come natural. The flesh will fight it. You'll forget Start off in the morning, oh, Lord, I, I love you, I feel you, I'm going to listen to you all day, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to let you guide me through the day and through my life, and then, you know, by the time you get out to your car in the driveway, you've forgotten what you meant to do, and that jerk next door, you know, parked in front of your house, and you can't get out of your driveway, and you get on the freeway, and it's like, oh, and, you know, and, and it's just not easy to do, but, but you can we can, it's there for us, live in the constant awareness of God's Spirit. And the other one is almost just like it. It's, it's to live, you know, again, walk step by step, moment by moment, breath by breath, heartbeat by heartbeat. In the awareness that God loves you and accepts you no matter what no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what your secrets are. You know, he knows your secrets, so no sense in trying to hide behind those. What we talked about last, last time about being uh, unexpurgated, right? Which means unedited, just natural, open scars, scabs, wounds. You know, here I am, Lord. We can walk in that awareness of his acceptance and his grace. And that's, in a sense, what he means when he means, it says to be sustained, to live on the flesh and blood. So these mockers, you know, Jesus refuses to play their game. He lays it out very clearly. He says, you, if you're going to be, you know, it's the first flush. If you're really one of mine, that means you'll eat my flesh and drink my blood. And, and, and people started to walk away. It's kind of the same thing he told Nicodemus. You know, Nick at night snuck out there. and Jesus said, you know, he said, what do I have to do, and, you know, to, to be right with God? And 
And Jesus told him, among other things, you know, the same thing he quotes here, the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone believes in him. Kind of echoes again Matthew 16, 24. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this uh, if the team wants to come out. I, I, I'm not getting nearly as far as I plan to, but I know we want to go home and go to bed eventually. So, deny yourself, take up your cross, right? This is the first flush. This is what you have to do if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to be one of mine. Now, remember, in the same chapter, somebody asked him, what work must we do to, to, to be your follower? And Jesus says, well, the work of the Lord is to believe in the one he sent. So it still boils down to faith. So these aren't things you must do, but these are things that you that you will do. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross. That's a verse that, you know, I've heard sermons, I've heard tapes of sermons, I've read books, we talked about it in different classes at Bible college. Uh, you know, I, uh, I've heard, I think, just about every angle, just about every way to approach that, deny yourself and take up your cross. But here's the one that I think works the best, is the clearest and, and as accurate as any. To deny yourself, and this is, you know, thus saith Pastor Ron, so take it, you know, be Berean about it. Uh, To deny yourself means to deny who the world says you are. The world says you're you're a dad, you're a grandpa, you know, you work at this place and you play softball on the weekends and the, the, and the world tries to fit you into its mold, right? And what he means when he says deny yourself, it's not deny yourself good things. That's what some of us assume. Deny yourself haagen <laughs> you know? Deny yourself everything that's fun and pleasant and enjoyable in life. That's not at all Jesus is what he's saying or that's not God's heart towards us. But deny who the world tells you you are and then take up your cross means to take up, you know, grab hold of, embrace who I say you are, who God says you are. Don't let the world convince you of your identity. Pastor Jack has a great message on identity and destiny. Maybe he'll share part of that again sometime. But don't buy in. Don't believe who the world says you are. Is the band coming out or am I, uh, do I have to do a soft shoe? And uh, I'll I'll sing a song. I don't mind. Um, I, I happen to have a guitar over there. I guess we could pull this off. Um, No, I mean, I'm not done now, but, uh, but uh, uh, they got to be coming. Uh, now I lost my place. <laughs> Deny who the world says you are. Embrace who God says you are. That's what I'm getting around to. You know, the, the, the rain has fallen. It's the first flush. And, those, and the, at the end of the passage, I kind of got off my notes here. Let me just cut to the chase. At the end of the passage, you know, there's a lot of people that go. You must eat my flesh, drink my blood. You must live, you must sustain yourself on me. And of course, we do that symbolically every time we take communion. And then it says a lot of people left, right? That first flush flushed out the majority of the people that were following him, that saw the miracles, that that, that knew or should have known who he was anyway as the the promised one. And then finally, it's just his closest followers, and Jesus looks at him and says, well, are you going to go too? You know, is this teaching too hard for you that you need to deny who the world says you are and embrace who the, I, the, who God says you are? And they, this is what they said. Where else would we go? Where else is there to go? Where where else can we go? Where else might we go? You know, a lot of us have already gone places that didn't work out, and then we came back, and then we went out, and then we came back. 
One week, I'm a Hindu. Okay, now I'm just a hippie. Then I'm going back, I'm going to be this. I'm going to believe in the Urantia book, and we're all planted here by spacemen, and we're going to conquer the planet, and then I'm going to be God of my own planet if I get a skinny enough black tie, and it's all going to come together for me, you know? And then, where else are you going to go? There is no place else to go, but there's no place else you need to go. And, and you don't need to do anything to go. You just need to open your heart, open your mind, open your life and receive. And just learn to be constantly aware of the influence of God's Spirit. And learn to live by faith, believing that Jesus is who He says He is, even when everything's blowing up. You know, the first chapter of James, he says, when they're coming at you from every direction, like bandits from out behind the rock. And man, I've felt like that a lot of times. I know that you have too. But where else are you going to go? The band's here. God bless you guys. What a great band, huh? I think I'll go play with them. Let's pray.